Well, <clears throat> Karen, CGS, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure as chairman of RUSI to welcome you all here this morning. This is one of the most important events in our calendar each year. We are, as you heard from Karen, one of the leading think tanks in the world on security and defense matters, and our job is to encourage thinking that is fresh, that is well-informed, that is independent, that is unconstrained by conventional wisdom or having to take place in the office. Um, and I hope you will all enjoy that at this conference over the next two days. Uh, our original founder, the Duke of Wellington, one of the greatest generals of all time, at least from the British uh, point of view, um, <laughs> illustrated very well the the difference between military and political leadership a lot of the time. Uh, he's an unusual case in British history because he's a case where we made a successful general prime minister, uh, something that's very rare uh, in British history, much rarer than in the United States, for instance. Um, but he chaired his first cabinet meeting as prime minister and they asked him afterwards how it had gone and he said it was absolutely extraordinary. He said, I gave them their orders and they all started discussing them. Uh, and he had, he had not really come across that before. <laughs> um, so at this meeting, you are meant to discuss those things. Uh, military people are meant to discuss those things as freely as possible. And I hope you will find it thought-provoking and productive. And I join in wishing well to our new chief of the general staff. I left government three years ago, which turned out to be a very good time to leave government in the United <laughs> Kingdom. Uh, Everything was running fine when I left. <laughs> and I left government three years ago, so I'm not up to date in daily contact with um, uh, military leaders behind the scenes in British government. Uh, but I did, on, on several difficult situations, uh, work with the new CGS in his previous role, and I witnessed the wisdom and the experience and the cool head and clear mind that he brought to those situations. And so I congratulate him on his uh, promotion and selection to this role and wish him well in it. Um, I am going to talk uh, for a short time about the overall strategic context. This is a world which is making unparalleled progress, but in which political risk and fragmentation is rising. And it's very important before we <clears throat> go through some of the risks to acknowledge the progress. If you are going to choose any time to be alive in history as a human being, you would almost certainly choose now in terms of lifespan, health, security, prosperity. We are at the first moment in human history where statistically, not only us, but the average human being is more likely to die from eating too much than from eating too little. Remember that before you have your lunch uh, later today. Uh, as one of the great commentators on our times, Yuval Noah Harari, has observed, three times as many people now die each year from diabetes than from all forms of violence, including war, terrorism, and crime. So as he puts it, sugar is now much more dangerous than gunpowder to the average human being. Uh, and that trend, that positive trend in lifespan, security, has been accelerated by the great changes of our lifetimes. If we want to simplify the history of our own lifetime so far, we would really say that three things have happened. Now, the Cold War has come to an end. Information technology has started to revolutionize economies, societies, and so many other activities, including military activities, and China has undertaken a massive and extraordinary rise in world affairs, particularly in the world economy. And those three things, the end of the Cold War, the advent of information technology, um, and the rise of China, add up to what we call globalization. And that globalization has, as it turns out, not brought about the triumph of a single system of government or society as was often imagined in the 1990s. It has not brought universal liberal democracy. It has not brought a consensus 
on how new problems such as increased migration or climate change should be tackled or a common understanding of how to conduct world affairs. And so a good deal of the optimism of the 1990s uh, at the end of the Cold War has not been <clears throat> justified. We have not reached the end of history, but now embarked on a new period, it seems, of unpredictability in which states and others maneuver for advantage in new ways, which others then find threatening. And a clear example, of course, of that, and one that I dealt with a lot in my years as Foreign Secretary of the UK, is relations between the West and Russia. Those relations were excellent for a time in the 1990s. The Cold War had ended, Russia was admitted to the G7 that became the G8, business and economic links were encouraged. As far as the Western countries were concerned, the expansion of the European Union and NATO uh, it, to the east was not a threat to Russia. It was not intended as a threat. Russia would become just like us, with the same strategic perspective. Uh, there was no need for a strategic difference or for anyone to feel threatened. And so in the 1990s, a vast misunderstanding arose between the West and Russia, and it is the origin of so many of the tensions and conflicts uh, between us today. Uh, the expansion of Euro-Atlantic institutions and Western democracy eastwards seemed natural to Western uh, countries, including the UK and France and the United States and Germany, um, but to Russia, which took a different path from our version of liberal democracy and has not changed the way of thinking of a large, of a country, a vast country with long land borders that have been invaded many times over the last two or three centuries, that expansion is perceived as a threat. And the tension that gives rise to feeds uncertainty and potential uh, and actual conflicts such as in eastern Ukraine uh, today. Many of us uh, who have been responsible for the foreign policy of Western countries have made huge efforts to restore relations with Moscow. And indeed, it reached a high point for me when I um, escorted President Putin around the London Olympics in 2012 and took him to the judo. He does judo and I do judo. We didn't play against each other at uh, judo, uh, but we watched Russians win gold medals. We drank a great deal of champagne. Uh, we exchanged all our judo terminology that baffled Prime Minister David Cameron when he joined in our conversation, that it was all in Japanese, it seemed. Um, and relations were at a very high point. But within a year, we had completely fallen out again uh, over events in Syria, and then within 18 months over Crimea and Ukraine. Having pushed the boulder up the hill, it rolled straight back down again. And that is the history repeated many times of our relations with Russia in recent years. So the end of the Cold War has brought new alliances and opportunities, but it's not brought to an end the hostile use of land forces in Europe itself. And at the same time, those processes of globalization which I spoke about are now bringing, it seems, the fragmentation of the West, a rise in populism and nationalism that is disruptive of international relations. Um, the CGS just spoke uh, about how elusive unity on strategy among Western countries seems to be, and this is quite correct. The G7 meeting two weeks ago broke up in the greatest disarray uh, of any uh, G7 meeting since it was invented and in our lifetimes, with other countries dumbfounded as to how they were meant to deal with relations with the President of the United States, rightly or wrongly, whatever point of view you take. On the Iran nuclear deal, which I had a part in uh, negotiating, we worked for years in close cooperation between Western allies and Russia and China to come to an agreement with Iran. And now we have the extraordinary sight of European foreign ministers sitting down with the foreign minister of Iran essentially to work out ways of countering the decisions of the United States and policy of the United States. 
an extraordinary development from the perspective of anyone who has served as Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom. There has been a major split between the United States and its European allies on important strategic issues, with a NATO summit now uh, imminent. The United Kingdom's exit from the European Union is another aspect of that fragmentation, not primarily about security issues, but it is causing, creating an impact on security issues. Cooperation, for instance, on the Galileo satellite system, including its use for military uh, purposes, is jeopardized by the negotiations now taking place and could be uh, severely disrupted um, by um, any agreement or lack of agreement made between the United Kingdom and the European Union. The result of those negotiations could be, the overall result, could be close allies diminishing each other's security or making each other's security more expensive than it might otherwise uh, have been. And these developments are taking place just when alliances need updating to reflect the changed nature of politics and warfare. Uh, it is very clear from recent conflicts in Syria or in Ukraine uh, or between Israelis and Palestinians that successful military operations are now often closely related to social media operations and often accompanied by cyber operations. Indeed, there are accounts in some of these conflicts of military operations in support of social media operations rather than the other way around. Um, and uh, I think that it is very important to update uh, military thinking and concepts for that. I don't say so as an expert in any way on military affairs. Um, but looking at the strategic position and how conflicts are now fought. I personally have advocated, for instance, that NATO needs a new concept of hybrid warfare urgently and an Article 5B addressing and allowing a collective response to hostile action in cyberspace, social media, conventional media, or with undeclared armed forces in a situation that is not declared war but is definitely not peace uh, either. And armed forces in the 21st century will need to be part of the coordination of strategies across more dimensions than has ever been the case uh, before. Fighting terrorism is another example of that need. Terrorists are at a severe disadvantage in this world of uh, greater technology and information flows, but they are adept at finding asymmetric ways of using it for their own purposes. And social media allows a global franchise to be developed rapidly uh, for an international terrorist uh, organization. Um, uh, defeating them means winning over local populations, and that is critically important. So with every military maneuver, uh, it becomes a political maneuver as well, and many of you are thoroughly familiar with that. All of these factors are bringing greater uncertainty into world affairs. Um, and as Foreign Secretary in the UK, I found it was more useful to invest money in a crisis center that I could activate in the Foreign Office at half an hour's notice to deal with crises no one had predicted than it was to invest in more people predicting the next crisis. Capability and resilience was more important than perfect analysis of what was going to happen next. Uh, we had to deal with all the unpredictable events uh, of the, uh, what was initially called uh, the Arab Spring, uh, and the effects of that are still going on. And it's important to add to this the recognition that we are living economically and financially in a relatively benign time in the world, and that will not go on forever. We can't forecast economics either, and indeed, nor can economists, as we well know. Uh, but we can bet from economic history that we're closer to the next recession than we are to the last one. And that will exacerbate uh, political problems. Further exacerbating them is unbalanced growth of the world's population. The United Nations expects the growth of half the growth of the world's population in the next 30 years to be in nine countries. There are around 200 countries in the world. Half the population growth is in nine of them. 
Uh, any understanding of the strategic context in the world means knowing which nine countries those are. Five of those are in Africa. And the doubling of the population of Africa and the Middle East in the next 30 years might fuel conflict, of course, uh, but above all, it threatens to overwhelm the unity and stability of Europe uh, through political reaction to increased migration flows, something we're seeing in uh, Italy, Germany, and other European countries at the moment. Now, I've mentioned the consequences of two of those three big changes in world affairs in our lifetimes. What of the third one, the rise of China? Overall, this is massively positive in world affairs. Hundreds of millions of people lifted out of poverty. Now an engine, of the strongest engine of the world economy uh, overall. This has opened up many areas of strategic cooperation now and in the future with China. And the great challenge of relations with China is to manage a balance of competition and cooperation. But there will be competition. Uh, the speech of President Xi Jinping last October at the Chinese Communist Party Congress is the most important speech given in the world in recent years, and I recommend everyone to read it. It is three and a half hours long. It took three and a half hours to deliver, so reading it is the easy uh, option. Uh, but it is a most important speech, setting out the clear goals of China to 2035 and then to 2050, including by the middle of the century, world-class armed forces and leadership, global leadership in technology and including in artificial intelligence with a system of government quite distinct from the West and ready for adoption by other countries. Here we have the clue to the strategy of Kim Jong-un at the Singapore summit last week, seeking external security in order to then follow his own version of this model, distinct from South Korea and distinct from Western uh, thinking of tight centralized party control and a more diversified economy uh, at the same time. So we can see in this thinking future strategic developments but most of all, we can see a coming strategic race in artificial intelligence. And I believe that who is in the lead in the 2040s in AI will become as important as who was in the lead in the 1940s in developing the atomic bomb. And AI and cooperation between governments, military, and the private sector uh, will become a vital part of this strategic context. So it is a context, therefore, of unprecedented uh, progress in world affairs, including peace for the great majority of the world, uh, but nevertheless um, uh, bringing risks inherent in each of the driving forces behind globalization that has brought so many benefits in each of the three great drivers, there are new political and strategic uh, risks. Um, so uh, I believe it will be a time uh, of where it's vital to understand political and technological maneuver alongside military uh, maneuver. And I'm confident that the need for professional armed forces to have a strong understanding of this global strategic context and their own required capabilities, therefore, and the need to think in new dimensions will be necessary for a long time to come. I hope you'll be able to discuss these things and many other things uh, together, because discussing them together in a transparent forum um, is part of how we guard against fragmentation uh, and lack of unity and lack of clear thinking, uh, those things being considerable dangers to the conduct of world affairs. So I strongly welcome you here again uh, to this conference, and I hope you have a very successful couple of days. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah.